Welcome to another Battle of the Ports Remastered. This time we are taking a look at Afterburner 1 and 2. The original video released on the 26th of June 2014, featuring 22 versions of Afterburner but ran at 720p at 30 frames per second. This remastered version of the video features 24 versions of the game recorded in 1080p at 60 frames per second and presented in chronological order with a voiceover. So what is Afterburner? Well, it's an arcade flight combat game developed and released by Sega in 1987. There are two versions of the game, the original Afterburner and Afterburner 2, which was released later the same year. Both games are basically the same with part two adding throttle controls, three more stages, some gameplay tweaks and slightly arranged music. Besides that, they are the same game. In Afterburner you control an American F-14 Tomcat fighter jet destroying incoming enemies using both a machine gun and a limited supply of heat seeking missiles. The game was designed by Sega veteran Yu Suzuki and runs on the Sega X-Board arcade system which is capable of surface and sprite rotation. Afterburner was also the fourth Sega arcade game to use the hydraulic Taycan motion simulator arcade cabinet although the one used for Afterburner is more elaborate than the earlier Taycan simulator games. The cabinet simulates an aircraft cockpit with flight stick controls, a chair with seatbelt and hydraulic motion technology that moves, tilts, rolls and rotates the cockpit in sync with the on-screen action. Back in 1987, this was an amazing experience. I was 12 at the time and I tell you, it blew me away. The very first port of any Afterburner game was released on December 12, 1987 for the Sega Mark III Master System and was ported in-house by Sega AM2. For the time, Master System Afterburner was a massive cartridge size weighing in at 4 megabit. Most games on the system at this time range from 256 kilobytes to 2 megabit. The port plays really well considering the limitations of the Master System. The graphics are also large, bright and free from flicker. The FM soundtrack on this Japanese version is really good too, although it does lack all the tunes of the arcade version. The game also lacks the throttle controls since the mass system only features two buttons. One for the guns and the other for missiles. Still, despite this, the game is surprisingly playable. Yeah, it is jerky, but still a lot of fun and not bad for the first port on any system. Ok, the next bunch of ports all came out in 1988. Let's start off with this UK port for the Commodore 64 by Dalali Software. Oh boy, this is one heap of crap. Well, let's start off with the plus points. You do have automatic guns, so pressing the fire button shoots off missiles. There's music in game too, but it's only average at best. And that is where the good points end. This port just looks awful, plays really poorly, and we can't even rotate the screen. A true sad mess.
in 1989, Weeby developed another version of Afterburner for the Commodore 64 in the US, and it is much better than the crap we got in Europe. For a start, the opening music is really good. Just a shame there is no music in game. The sound effects are nice though. Sadly, the game plays poorly. It seems most of the enemy craft come from behind, while in the arcade, most enemies come from in front. But that's not the big issue here. The big problem is the collision detection. It's quite bad. At times you'll die, even though there is nothing else even on screen. The lack of rapid fire is also an issue. Every time you press the fire button to shoot the guns, you also shoot off a missile, resulting in them running out very quickly. While this US version is better than the garbage Euro release, it still isn't all that good. Next up we have the ZX Spectrum port by Software Studios. Now this is more like it in terms of playability. Not too bad for an 8-bit home micro. It's fast, smooth for the system and features big sprites. We also get a choice of in-game music or sound effects. Both are pretty dire to be honest. The music is off-key and well, quite awful arrangements of the original tunes. But hey, if you play with the sound off, this isn't too bad at all. Amstrad CPC release is basically the same as the ZX Spectrum one, but now in color with better defined graphics. The way it plays and runs is identical. Sadly, this port has no in game music, but that's okay since judging from the title theme, it would probably suck if there was any. Even the MSX got a port of Afterburner. It says this one is copyright of Microsoft, but I have a very strong feeling that the true developers were Software Studios, as this is identical to the ZX Spectrum port in every way. Argonaut Software brought Afterburner to the Atari ST in 1988 with an impressive opening music track followed by an attempt to recreate the arcade's title effects. But once the game starts, it all falls apart. The playability, as with all western ports so far, isn't like the arcade game and in this game's case, isn't very fun at all. It's time for the Amiga release, also by Argonaut Software. This is the exact same crap that is on the Atari ST, with all the same issues. Poor gameplay, awful frame drops and all round mess. It does have better sound effects and speech mind you. Ok, 
Okay, moving on to the second Amiga release of Afterburner for the US market from Weeby Games. This is a much better attempt than what Europe got, but it is still pretty bad. On the positive side, there are some reasonable attempts to recreate the soundtrack, but that's about it. The actual game is slow and janky. Nothing is smooth and the collision detection, as with most of the western ports, is awful. Also, all the western ports mess up the barrel roll. It should be performed by movement in one direction then flipping in the opposite direction. All the western home micro ports just have you tapping twice in the same direction. I guess in stills this looks good, but in action it certainly does not bring home the arcade experience. Ultimate Software are behind this PC MS-DOS port that can be played in a variety of graphics modes, with this 16 colour option being the best. That's not to say this is a good port though, oh no. Collision detection is bad, controls are off and the audio is terrible. Japanese players must have been laughing their asses off at this, when Japanese PCs such as the Sharp X68000 and the FM Towns crap on this from a great height. Finally back to the Japanese systems, but surprisingly a western port. This is the Tengen port for the Nintendo Entertainment System. After playing the home micro ports, this one actually feels like the arcade in a way. The barrel roll is correct, we get adequate amount of missiles and the collision detection is better. The game is still a little janky, but overall it isn't too bad. On March 30th, 1989, Sunsoft released an updated version of the Tengen game for the Japanese market on the Famicom. This port updates the graphics, improves the music, adds speech, adds the arcade intro scenes, and cleans up some of the sprite flicker found in the Tengen original. It even plays a little tighter. Definitely the better of the two Nintendo 8-bit options. March 1st, 1989 saw the release of the FM Towns version by CSK. Now, CSK are not known for great ports. Sure, they have a few, such as the Saturn port of Virtual On, but they are mostly a lackluster company, and this FM Town port of Afterburner kind of shows that. While they've gone for a massive showing of sprites, the game isn't very smooth, and at times it looks cluttered. But at least this is more like the arcade than anything we've seen so far. I do like the inclusion of the arranged soundtrack and the addition of some very clean looking digital images. This port is heading in the right direction, but misses the mark somewhat. Monster of Arcade Ports, the Sharp X68000 graced us with a port of Afterburner by Dempa on April 26, 1989. Now this is more like it. 
While it lacks the amount of sprites on screen found in the FM Towns port, this one plays much better and has true analog controls. I'm actually playing this with the mouse and it feels sublime. Everything is just silky smooth. Back in 1989, nothing came close to this port. Even the audio is a very good representation of the arcade soundtrack, complete with all speech and music tracks. Fire, fire. The enemy! The enemy! Moving on to 1990 and on March 23rd we saw the release of the Mega Drive port, also by Dempa. So it comes as no surprise that this is a watered down release of the X68000 port, but that's not to mean it is a bad port. We get all the stages, all the music recreated in a reasonable manner and all the speech. But most importantly is that this port also features analog controls. Yes, that's right. If you were fortunate enough to own Dempa's XC-1AP, you could play this game in the exact same fluidity as the Sharp X68000 port. Very nice. Bits Laboratory developed the PC Engine port, with NEC releasing it on September 28, 1990. In many ways this port is better than the Mega Drive game. It features the runway landing sections and more on screen at times, but it does run a little slower, has weaker but still great audio and isn't analog compatible. But still, this is a fantastic port and even includes a bit of sprite scaling and a cool 3D room so you can mess about with the logo balls. A couple of years went by without any Afterburner release, then on July 13th 1995, Rutubo Games gave us Afterburner Complete for the Sega Super 32X, or just 32X in the West. This port was touted as being arcade perfect, but in reality it is not. While it is the closest to the arcade original at home yet, it isn't perfect. For a start the frame rate is half of the arcade, running at just 30 frames per second. The scaling is also more blocky than the arcade game, and also not as smooth. The audio on the other hand is outstanding, fantastic recreations of the music and excellent stereo used on the sound effects. The plane's jets sound especially good.
Dutable Games, we're back on September 27th, 1996 with the Saturn port. Everything that was wrong with the 32X version was fixed here. The game now runs at 60 frames per second and features super clean scaling. We even have true analog controls. Basically, this is the best home non-emulated port ever made that will allow you to play on a TV screen and that includes being better than the Dreamcast version. September 6, 2001 saw AM2's port of Afterburner to the Dreamcast. Originally found within Shenmue 1 and 2, it finally got a release with Yu Suzuki's other games on the Japanese-only Yu Suzuki Gameworks. This port is very close to the arcade version, but lacks any options and the upscale graphics don't look as sharp as the Saturn game. we have one of the most disgusting ports of modern times. In 2003, Bit Studios, not to be confused with the Japanese developer Bit Laboratory, released the Sega Arcade Gallery that contains nothing but utter shit ports of Afterburner, Outrun, Space Harrier and Super Hang On. This Afterburner port is incredibly slow, has no Afterburner option and you can't barrel roll. Or if you can, I sure as hell can't figure it out. The game also plays nothing like Afterburner thanks to the plane being stuck in the center of the screen. This just sucks big time. Avoid. On March 25, 2004, the Sega Ages Volume 10 by Sims was released. This port ditches the 2D graphics and replaces them with 3D polygons. Besides that, this is still the same old afterburner. Personally, I think this game can look quite ugly in places due to the drab colors, but on the plus side, it is silky smooth and does feel somewhat like the original afterburner. The analog controls also work well, making for a more arcadey feel than many of the previous ports. Sadly, this is just lacking that little something to make it a classic. Extras consist of an arranged mode which lets you play as different planes, but it does not significantly affect the gameplay. Sometime in 2005, the mobile phone version of Afterburner was released. Actually, this is the Western release. The Japanese game is long lost and, as was the case 99% of the time, it was better than this port. 
Still, despite the lack of sound effects, music tracks and afterburner option, this still plays way better than the Game Boy Advance port. So that's something to consider. December saw M2 bring Afterburner to the Nintendo 3DS. First released as a download on December 18th, 2013, then on card as part of the Sega Ages final stage set on December 22nd, 2016. Apologies for the poor video quality here, but I had to capture this footage by pointing my camera at a real 3DS. So yeah, there will be some artifacts on the screen as that is the nature of filming a 3DS screen directly. So what did M2 bring to the table with this port? Well, first we have the game in 3D, obviously, and I must say that the effect worked really well. Of course, this feature can be switched off. The game also comes in true 16x9 aspect ratio now. This isn't a stretch 4x3 image, mind you. M2 have actually expanded the gameplay area for native 16x9 experience. We also have the standard 4x3 option and a whole host of screen bezels taken from the real arcade variants and even a mode where the arcade bezels tilt to give you the feeling of being in a Jaluxe arcade cabinet. Other extras include a special mode which introduces the burst option which slows down time so you can target multiple enemies and fire missiles at them in rapid succession. Also in special mode, Bonus stages have been replaced with a rival plane, the Battle Shoot. There's also an option to make all the smoke effects from missiles and such transparent, which makes the game look better. Overall, this is an amazing port that every Afterburner fan should experience. And just for a laugh, here's a quick look at Masterburner, a Dojin developed game by DNA Softwares and released in a package spoofing the Sega Ages 2500 line, dubbed Toho Ages. Masterburner replaces the generic F14 with Marisa Kirisame, a yellow haired witch from a variety of Toho shooters. Many of the landscapes are similar, although some take place in unique locations, like libraries. All of the enemies have been replaced with fairies and little comets that have goofy little grinning faces on them, like you see on Japanese message boards. And all the smoke trails have been replaced with colourful streams of transparent stars. And one more bonus for you, this is Afterburner 3D from Italian independent studio Brodadora. Sadly the official webpage for this game and the developers page is no longer available, but a google search will enable you to find this game. As you can see it doesn't really follow the arcade stage design and it also has no throttle control. The speed is automatically determined by the stage. Still for a free title this isn't too bad.
all those versions of Afterburner running side by side. 